Well, that was super exciting. Wasn't that an exciting countdown? And here we are. Uh, starting class number 49 of Shir Hashirim. And I, I made a remark about dedications last week. And I, I didn't do my homework to follow up and find out what the story is with dedications. What I said was there may be some limitation to the power of dedication if something particularly isn't. Um, done special for the person to whom the class is being dedicated. So maybe we dedicated the, the countdown for uh, <laughs> all of tonight's dedications. Um, not that I have too many especially, but um, I do want to at least remember my um, mother, my mother-in-law's mother, whose yard site was this past week, I believe, this past week, um, and will and my mother and my father-in-law's mother, Allah Shalom, whose yard site will be the day following Tisha B'av. So um, technically, it's Sunday when we're going to be fasting. Is the is the yard site because Tisha B'av Shabbos, so we're not fasting till the next day. So. Um, I guess we're probably not going to have a class on Tisha B'Av, so we'll have in mind. Um, I don't have the names, but um, uh, my 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 mother-in-law's mother was uh, Grandma Dora, Dora Oxenhorn, and my father-in-law's mother was um, Sadie Merwis. So the Neshams should have an Aliyah. Um, also, I'd like to, if, again, I don't know if, how much it works, but I want to dedicate the class for Rufuah Shlema for my good friend Menachem Ruven ben Minya And um, if that's not possible, then just uh, uh, have, him, have him in mind in your in your prayers. Menachem Ruven ben Minya Hinda. We already have two comments in the live chat. Shalom, Rabbi from Razel. Shalom, Razel. And Shalom Thank for Big J. Big J Shalom. Hannah, what'd you say? I just wanted to ask something. My he wasn't Jewish, but my father's um death anniversary is coming up on August tenth. And can we remember him? Let's remember what's it what's his name? Robert. Robert. Robert Robert what? Joy Jr. Robert Joy Jr. We're remembering Robert Joy Jr. Dearly departed. His neshama should have an aliyah, as we say. His soul should be elevated. I just saw today, I just saw today a letter. There were, there were a few famous people passed away today, like literally today. One was the head of the um, rabbinic court in Jerusalem, the head of the Badats. The, the rabbinic court in Jerusalem, uh, Rabbi Weiss, and um, he I saw published, they, they, they put out, or they circulated a letter that he had written to the family of an individual who was responsible for saving him from uh, World War II, um, that they were smuggled kids to, to safety in England, I believe. They smuggled kids, you know, kinder transport, whatever it was. They smuggled kids to safety. And um, so there was a particular individual in England who had uh, been responsible for saving Rabbi Weiss's life as a child. So he wrote a, a letter to the family thanking them, you know, years later. And in the letter, he says, you know, may the, you know, my, my because of my children and my grandchildren are all here in this world because of him. You know, and may that the lives that he saved stand as a merit for him and, and elevate his soul in the, in the next world. So somebody pointed out, you see that the head of the Jerusalem rabbinical court acknowledged that, uh, you know, righteous non-Jew has a share in the world to come and their, their soul can, can achieve uh, an elevation in the next world. So we hope the same for your father's neshama khana. Thank you. And with no further ado, unless there's further ado, let's um, put the text on the screen. 
bear with me, please, for a moment. Okay, I'm going to go with this view here. Okay, this is actually last week's verse um, where he says, uh, You are beautiful, my beloved. We translate it as when you are desirable. And the way we explained it according to Rashi, that you made yourself desirable by proclaiming in verse 3, I am for my beloved and my beloved is for me. He who shepherds among the flowers. Um, sort of standing up to the enemies of the Jewish people who would try to interfere with our relationship with God and say, you know, get out of here. Um, being strong in our in our dedication and devotion to God. Um, so he calls her beautiful for this and desirable. Nova Kirushalayim, beautiful like Jerusalem. Um, so we, we talked about the um, the way that this is the second temple period. And we had in the previous periods of, of uh, the Jewish history story of the relationship with Hashem, different praises that came along. And so every time we get to like a, a pleasant episode, uh, a pleasant time period of the relationship, we sort of hark back to uh, those earlier days. So here we're, we're back in Jerusalem again with the second temple, but saying beautiful like Jerusalem, like the first time. There's a restoration of that beauty of that of that love. And then finally, Ayumaka Nigdalos, we said Ayuma meaning awesome or, or, or causing awe or fear to come over those who see her. Kanigdalos from the word Degel, again meaning a flag, referring to um, troops of soldiers she's she's awesome to look at like bands of of angels that are the host of god um so that was last time so i just wanted to quickly sum that up before we go on now this is a very beautiful verse let's get right into it stop me at any time it says as follows verse five chapter six verse five hasebi einayich minegdi Shehem here he vuni sareh ke eder ha izim shegalishu min hagil od, which means Hasebi enaich minegdi. Hasebi is from the word like lehistovev in Hebrew to turn around, sivuv is a turning. Hasebi says turn enaich your eyes minegdi from opposite me, meaning you're facing me. You're looking at me with your eyes. You're making eye contact with me. And he says, turn your eyes away. Why? Shehem here hivuni. Because they are causing me to become excited, as it were. They're causing me to become um, very uh, infatuated and perhaps lustful. Sareich ke'eder ha'izim. Your hair is like the flock of goats. That slid down from Gilad, which is a, a mountain. Now, this last part should be familiar. I put a little footnote here, number six, which is um, that we had earlier in, um, actually didn't put it in footnote number six, but it's in one of the footnotes uh, in my notes, that we had earlier a very similar verse in chapter four. And again, one of the earlier periods where he's in a in a state of close love with her, and he praises her for her beauty. Um, one of the, the things that he does is he praises her. Um, he praises her hair. Here it is. I put it in, in footnote eleven. So we have ways to go, but in in chapter four, verse one, it says. Uh, Behold, you are beautiful, my beloved. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are like doves. Behind your, now tzamasech, we translated there as behind your hair ties. A tzama was some type of a thing that a woman put over her hair in order to keep her hair tightly tied behind her head. And he says, and Rashi explained that behind that item, that ties her hair back, your hair is like the flock of goats, 
Shegoloshu Mehar Gilad, that slid down from Mount Gilad. So we have a parallel praise in this section, like we did two chapters ago in that section. But let's go back a little bit first, after pointing that out. Let's go back a little bit to where it says that he should tur- she should turn her eyes away because they're causing him to become excited. I'd like to examine the commentary on that. Any questions till now? So, uh, let's let's look at the commentary. Turn your eyes away from facing me. Like a young man. That the one to whom he is betrothed is beloved to him and is pleasant to him. And she has beautiful eyes. And he says to her, Turn your eyes away from facing me. Because when I see you, my heart becomes excited. And Mizga means like becomes haughty upon me. It causes me to become haughty, maybe a little bit too forward. It's it's um provoking me to to behave in a very forward manner towards you that maybe is not becoming. Viruchi gasabi, my spirit is inflated within me, as it were. The is apik, and I can't hold myself back. By looking at your eyes, I'm just irresistibly drawn to you in a way that, you know, shouldn't be uh, indulged. Uh, fine. So going here, he says, there, here's what it represents. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be he said, B'mikdash zeh i'efshir lahashiv lachem aron v'chapores uchruvim. I cannot put into this temple this second temple, I cannot return to you the Aron, that is the Ark, the Chapores, that's the cover of the Ark, Uchruvim, and the, the, the cherubs, the angelic golden figures that extended from the top of the Ark. This was all one unit, the Ark with its with its cover and the, and the cherubs. I cannot return those to you in the second temple. Um, scrolling down, okay. Shehem here hivuni bevayis rishon. Those items, the ark with its cover and the cherubs in the first temple, ha- had caused me to become very excited over you. Leharos chemchi biyaseira, and I showed you an especial degree of love at that time. Ad shema altimbi, until you betrayed me, until you betrayed me. So it's an interesting statement. He's saying, even though I've returned you, and even though I love you, but there is a limit. I can't go as far in this temple as I did in the first one because I I showed you so much love in the first one. I went so overboard with love that when you betrayed me, it really, really hurt me deeply in such a way that I'm not prepared. I'm sort of adding my own interpretation here, but... In other words, why is God saying this? It's almost like he's saying, I'm not prepared to allow myself to become vulnerable again to the same degree. We're back together. I love you. Where this relationship is, this bond is continuing, but I'm turning down the heat a little bit. I need to keep the heat turned down a little bit because last time when I turned up the, the heat a lot in this relationship, I ended up becoming splashed with cold water. So I just need to keep my expectations a little bit lower this time. That seems to be the message. So turn your eyes away means your eyes. What are the, what do the eyes represent here? The ark with its cover and the cherubs and the tablets that were inside. You have to add that on the tablets were in there, right? I cannot return those to you. So those eyes that you used to have, you're going to have to keep them turned away. I'm not returning to you those items in this temple. Um, Any questions on that? So I wanted to look at a few things in the notes, in my notes. I made a bunch of notes here that are very interesting, I thought. Um, So now, one of the things that I pointed out in the notes 
is as follows. Here it says, your hair is like a, fl a flock of goats that um, came down from the from the, the Mount Gilad, right? Now, maybe I should save that part. Maybe I should save that part because we're still we're still sort of dealing with the first part of the eyes. So maybe I won't go there just yet. Let's let's save that for later. It says like this: um, in this temple, I cannot return to you the ark and its cover with the cherubs. So in note number nine, note number nine, I brought the verse in Tanakh which indicates this. How do we know that the ark and the how do we know that the ark was not present in the second temple? That's what's being stated here. The second temple was absent the ark. Now, what I didn't include here, and I should have, and I'm sorry that I didn't, is that Josiah hid the ark. One of the things that Josiah did before the downfall of, of Jerusalem was that he hid the ark away somewhere. We, till this day, don't know where it is. But it's somewhere sunken into the Temple Mount. That deep inside the Temple Mount, that's about all we know from tradition. There are legends of you know, archaeologists searching and finding. There's e there's even a, there's actually a Mishnah. There's a Mishnah in Tractate Yuma that says that there was a Kohen in the Second Temple who, you know, was exploring around and he discovered where the the the, the, the Ark was buried in the Temple Mount. And before he could tell anybody, he dropped dead. So there's similar legends of archaeologists that thought they had found it and it seems that everybody who tried to reveal its place uh, was unsuccessful in doing so for one reason or another um but it didn't return it didn't return to the second temple we still don't have it so there's a verse that hints to this in the book of Haggai in the book of Haggai chapter 1 verse 8 it says as follows Alu Hahar now the prophet says to the people ascend the mount Vahavesem eats and bring wood, Uvnu Habayas, and build the house, the Ertzaboi, the Ertzabo, and I will desire it. The Ekovda, and I will be honored, I will be glorified. Omar Hashem, said Hashem. So that the, the, the prophet is saying in the name of Hashem, this Haggai speaking to the people between the destruction of the first temple and the construction of the second. And he's instructing them, go up to the mountain and build the second temple. This was the instruction of the prophet, uh, which they do. In the book of Chagay, they go ahead and they and they build. But what you'll notice here is that it says, and I will be glorified. But this, in brackets here, indicates how we pronounce the word. But in a scroll, it's written like this. Missing the letter hey, even though it's pronounced the ekavida as though it would be spelled with a hey at the end, it's written the ekavade without the hey. So, what is the meaning of the missing letter hey? So, the meaning of the missing letter hey is as follows we look at Rashi, Rashi's commentary on that verse says, the ekavida, and I will be glorified. Chaser hey, it's missing the letter hey, says Rashi. Look. It's pronounced ve'ekavida, but it doesn't have a hey at the end. Keneged chamisha dvarim shahayu b'mikdash rishon. This corresponds to five things which were present in the first temple. Velo hayu b'mikdash sheni, but they were not present in the second temple. What are these five things? Aron, the ark, urim v'tumim. The urim v'tumim was. That the high priest wore a breastplate, as prescribed in the Torah, and the the breastplate had twelve stones on it, corresponding to the twelve tribes of Israel, and the names of the tribes were inscribed on the stones, and inside the breastplate, tucked into the layers of the breastplate, was a scroll that had a special name of God on it, and they could ask the breast plate questions you know like lahavde like a magic eight ball and the answer would light up the letters of the names of the tribes the letters that would form 
the answer to the question would light up and you needed a special um, divine um, spirit, like a Holy Spirit, a Ruach HaKodesh, to know how to arrange the letters into the words properly. Otherwise, you could jumble the message and get it wrong. And we have stories like that, but I'm not going to go so far afield. Um, but the, the Urim Vitumim refers to the name of God that was inside the breastplate that would cause the, the, the plate to light up. Urim, like the word or, light. And Tumim, from the word Tam, which means uh, perfect, because it would light up the perfect answer to the question. Urim Vitumim. So that also was missing from when they made the clothing of the second temple for whatever reason, they did not have that name to maybe they, they had lost the tradition of what the name was. I'm not sure the reason, but they didn't have the name in the breastplate. They didn't, the breastplate in the second temple did not have this supernatural ability. The ash and the fire in the first temple were told that a fire would descend from heaven to consume the, sacrifices but not so in the second temple ushkina and the divine presence was not present in the second temple as it was in the first and was it completely absent that can't be because we saw in the verses earlier that god's divine presence returned with them to to israel and also even remained in the diaspora communities so there had to be some degree of the divine presence but it means to a diminished degree not like it was in the first temple and we actually covered in one of the classes earlier the, the miracles, the miracles that took place in the first temple that, that did not take place in the second temple. And those manifest miracles, those supernatural occurrences were the, the proof, the evidence that the divine presence was there. And we did not experience those in the second temple. And therefore, we felt that there was a degree of the divine presence that had not returned. The Ruach HaKodesh and also the Divine Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, meaning there were no prophets in the Second Temple. There were no prophets in the Second Temple. All the prophets that lived at the time of the Second Temple also lived at the time of the First Temple. They had lived through the exile and they continued to live in the beginning of the Second Temple period and then passed away. And there were no new prophets in the time of the Second Temple. So that was a fifth thing that was gone. So the Ark, the Urim Vitumim, the fire that would come down, the divine presence to some degree, and the Holy Spirit, the spirit of prophecy. These things were all absent from, these five things were absent from the second temple, which is hinted in the spelling of the word, and I will be glorified in the second temple, that God's glory was subtracted five degrees, as it were. These are the five degrees. So though the word is pronounced with a hey, it is written without a hey to indicate this disparity. Okay, now the source for this is a passage in the Gemara in Yuma, the Talmud in Tractate Yuma. It doesn't add so much to what I just said, except in Rashi's comments here and his commentary to Chagai, he only mentions the Aron. The difference is that the way it's stated in the Talmud is it says Aron v'chapores uchruvim. It lists the ark with its cover and the kruvim. So if you aren't keen, you might count too many things here. It's like, Aaron, okay, that was missing. Kaporus, the cover was missing. Kruvim, the cherubs were missing. Ash, the fire was missing. Shechina, the divine presence was missing. Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit was missing. Urim Vitumim. That's seven things. I know how to count. So we need to understand that Aaron v'chaporus uchruvim, the Ark with its cover and cherubs are all one unit. It's all the Ark. The Ark had a cover. The cover had cherubs. That's one unit called the Ark. And that's what Rashi means in his commentary to Chagai when he only lists the Aron. He's not subtracting from what it says in the Gemara. He's just abbreviating what it says in the Gemara. I'm just pointing that out because in his commentary here, um, in his commentary here to Shir Hashirim, he points out all three items. Aron v'chaporos uchruvim, the ark, the cover, and the cherubs, just like in the Talmud. Spells out all the items there. So I think I also put Rashi's commentary to the Talmudic passage there where he says, Aron kaporos uchruvim, here's Rashi's comments on the Talmud. The ark, the cover, and the kruvim, the cherubs, 
Kule Chada Milsa. These are all one thing. He clarifies that in his um, in his uh, commentary there. So that's the source for this this uh, point of Rashi that he says, "Turn your eyes away. I can't bring back the ark with its cover and the cherubs." Now, why they're called eyes? Um, my thought on this. Does anyone have a thought why these are called eyes? Anyone have thought of this? My thought on why this is these are called eyes is because um, the, we're told, and we learned this previously in the in the series, that Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit, if you will, God's speech, God's speech to Moses, and by extension to the prophets, emerged from the, the space above the ark, between the cherubs. From that space above the cover of the ark between the cherubs is where prophecy emerged from. And prophecy is what allowed the prophets to have prophetic eyes, to have visions uh, which they were shown. They were shown these, these prophetic visions. So therefore, I think it was called the eyes that without the ark, we had no prophecy and therefore we did not have prophetic vision. I, th I think that's the reason these are compared to the eyes. Okay. So no ark in the second temple, that's turn your eyes away from me, right? I cannot once again show you so much love like I did in the first because of the way that you that you betrayed me then. I won't allow myself to, to once again be betrayed from such a high place of love. So another thought I had on this is that we, we see it's very tragic, it's very sad. But we see there's a diminishing, there's a diminishing of levels that takes place when we, you know, we had, you know, without going back through the whole book, but we had many, again, periods of closeness with Hashem and then the periods of distance because of our sins. And in each one, you know, we, we betray Hashem and he forgives us, but every forgiving, it seems like we've put a distance and a damage that doesn't quite allow a full restoration. Like even when we saw, I'm not going to go back now, but with the sin of the uh, of the um, the sin of the golden calf, right? We spoke a little bit about this. That originally, what happened is that the divine presence rested on every single individual Jew in such a way that they had the you know the so-called crowns. They had the rays of light coming out of them which were the divine presence resting on each individual. But after the sin of the calf, the crowns were removed. And when they did teshuva, Moshe received the crowns. That's why his face glowed. It glowed with the full glory of the, of the divine presence that had been collected from all the other Jews and combined onto him. And then God said he'll only bring his presence um, first to Moshe's tent alone and then to the tent of meeting which was at the center of the tabernacle, so that God does return his presence. However, he does it in a more limited way. Now they have to come to the tabernacle to be in God's presence, whereas before God's presence rested on the people individually. Then we had the sin of the spies, and there was a, a certain distance that was created because of that, which wasn't, they, they didn't, uh, re-achieve a closeness till the time of Joshua and the building of the tabernacle at Shiloh, etc. So here again, it seems that we, we, we come back to Jerusalem. We're reunited with Hashem. However, th there's once again, we lost another little chunk. We lost another little chunk. And we're still waiting for Mitz Hashem, the time of Mashiach and the final redemption and the, the, the third temple period when everything's going to come back. And that we we looked at at that during those classes, we looked at the prophecies about how once again the divine presence is going to rest on every individual like before, and there will be so to speak no special significance to uh, the Aron, right? People aren't going to say Aron Hashem, Aron Hashem. I don't know if anyone remembers this class. We're not going to say the, the 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 Ark of God, the Ark of God anymore. Why? Because every, the, the the divine presence will rest on everyone in the time of Mashiach like it rested on the Ark of God prior to those times. So each step of the way, we're, we're, we, we come close with Hashem, and then we unfortunately cause 
Hashem to depart from us and we get back together, but each time there's a little bit lost. And that little bit that's lost, we're still waiting for all that to come back at the end. So just pointing that out, here in the second temple, there was a diminishing to some degree from the first temple. Um, any questions so far? I said a lot. Any questions so far? Uh, doesn't have to be questions. I'll keep going. So um, what's the next part over here? Uh, by three shown. Okay. Uh, fine. Maybe, maybe I'll skip this. Here I put in the notes from chapter 3, verse 10, when it talks about the tabernacle. I think this was the tabernacle at Shiloh. Um, that it talks about the the um, poles of silver and the, um, the 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 golden cover of the of the uh, ark and the curtain, and it says that inside the holy of holies it was a rutzuf ahavan. If you remember this, it was whatever rutzuf means rutzuf with love, which we offer two meanings, either like. Ratzuf, like the word Ritzpa, which means a floor. And so to speak, it was tiled with love. We had some questions on that. A Ritzpa could also be a, a glowing coal. So it could mean sort of burning with love. And Rashi says that the love that was inside the Holy of Holies was Aron Vechaporos, Uchruv, and Veluchos. The ark, the cover, the cherubs, and the, and the, uh, and the, and the tablets, right? So... That exactly what God described in chapter three as the inside of the Holy of Holies being burning with love, that's exactly what's missing in the second temple. Basically, the Holy of Holies was an empty room. It was an empty room. Very sad. Um, let me see. Any other points that I wanted to bring out here? Okay, let's look at the next part. Let's look at the next part. Scrolling around, I'm sorry. Stop me at any time, by the way. It says, your hair is like the flock of goats which slid down from Mount Gilad. And as I pointed out, we had that before in chapter 4. So in footnote number maybe 11, I quoted that verse, right? Did I? Here's um, chapter 4, verse 1, right? Which we read before. And so there... Because here Rashi doesn't, Rashi doesn't seem to. Um, oh, he does. Here, in our chapter, chapter six, when it says your hair is like the flock of goats, he writes this. He writes biktanim verakim vidakim shebachem, in the small ones and the soft ones, which means like the young ones, vidakim, and the thin thin ones, among you, yesh shevach harbe. There is a lot of praise. So the hair here that's being described means even among the simplest Jews, the Ketanim, the children, even just among the children, the little ones, it's like the thin hair. There's very little substance there. It's just as thin as a hair. But it's like the flock of goats which comes down from Gilad. What is that? So we'll see what that is. But Rashi says that means it's praiseworthy. That even in the smallest ones among us, the young children, there's so much goodness to be found and to be praised. So if we go back to that original verse where this comes up, your hair is like the flock of goats that slides down from Mount Gilad. Um, he says he says as follows, um, your hair is beautiful and shiny. It has a, a, a bright white shine. Like the hair of white goats, which slide down from the mountains, and their hair shines into the distance. The imagery is these white mountain goats sliding down the mountain, and you can see the brightness of their white hair from a distance. So, too, her hair is very shiny. Again, I don't think he's complimenting her as having white hair, which would be the, which would be the, the, the feature of a, an older woman. But this is his young bride. But meaning your hair is like so, so smooth and shiny. Like that shininess is a is a compliment. And all the shampoo commercials, you know, the ladies with their, their floppy hair and they go like this. 
and their hair like flops around and you see like the reflection of the light on their hair and it's like so shiny look how our, our shampoo and conditioner is the best i watched too much tv when i was a kid i saw a lot of commercials so the shininess of the hair is 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 a a feature of beauty so he says your hair is so beautiful and shiny like like white like the hair of a flock of white goats and he says what is it there he tells us what it represents like this he says um even the empty ones among you are are beloved to me so that's similar to what we see here even the smallest simplest so to speak thinnest ones among you like hair thin like hair are, are full of praise they're beloved to me and he compares it like this like jacob and his sons who slid down from mount gilad when lavan caught them there for those who remember that class so um my thought here is what what was the praise what's the praise of oh like like jacob and his sons that that slid down from mount gilad on their way back from lavan's house where he caught them what was that all about so i wrote some notes there i'm just bringing them up now because it's so long ago that who remembers right so um what i wrote there is over there lavan lavan he catches yaakov and he says very nasty things to him he says you're a bad person you're a thief you're a liar you're a kidnapper you kidnapped my daughters you kidnapped my grandchildren you left in the middle of the night you didn't tell me you tricked me you, you, you didn't give me a chance to hug them and kiss them and say goodbye to them. What a terrible person you are. Whereas actually Lavan was the one who was torturing Yaakov for 20 years, stealing all his money, cheating him like crazy. We know how much Lavan cheated Yaakov. And Yaakov knew if I would try to tell Lavan I'm going to leave, he would trick me into staying. So he had no choice but to leave without telling him. But Lavan catches him and he tells him off, you're such a bad person. And you, you you would look at the picture and say, wow, Yaakov looks like the bad guy. Yaakov always looks like the bad guy. Oh, he, you know, he stole uh, Esau's uh, uh, birthright. You know, Esau came starving from the field and Yaakov extorted the birthright from him. And then he dressed up like Esau and he tricked his father and he got the, the blessings. It, it looks terrible. Yaakov always looks bad. Then he comes to Lavan's house and he says, I want to marry Rachel. And that uh, Rachel, right? And he works for seven years and Lavan tricks him into marrying Leah. And Yaakov comes to Lavan and he goes, you tricked me. You gave me the wrong one. And uh, and Lavan says, I tricked you. He said, you are a terrible person. L L L Leah is my older daughter. You wanted to marry my younger daughter. Is that Derek Eretz? Is that respectful? Is that nice? Here, my older daughter is waiting to get married, and you're going to skip her and go to the younger. How do you think that's going to make Leah feel that her younger sister goes gets married before her? That's not right. What are you thinking? You're a terrible person. Of course, I would never do such a thing like that. I'm very moral. I'm very moral. So, of, of course, you should have figured that I was going to give you Leah first as a bride. Because why would I allow my younger daughter to get married before my older daughter? I, I thought for sure you realized this was the plan all along. But it must be because you're such a twisted, perverted sicko, Jacob. He's loving saying to Jacob that you didn't even think for a second about Leah. What a selfish, terrible person you are. Lavan was always psychologically and verbally abusing Yaakov. And here at the last minute, he does it again, right? So the Torah reveals to us that even though Yaakov always looked like the bad guy and the anti-Semites were always, were always caricaturing us as the most devious and terrible people. But as a matter of fact, Hashem testifies that Jacob was righteous. So he appears to Lavan in a dream and he says, you better not, you better not mess with my Yaakov, that's my guy. Right? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is there to defend us. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed is He, is there to say, despite what it looks like on the outside, I know the truth that the Jews are really very righteous. And it's just the anti-Semites that are always trying to paint a negative picture on top of the Jews. So, um, so in a similar way, it says, that's, I thought to myself, maybe that's what it means, that it's like Jacob and his sons who came from, Mount Gilad when Lavan found them. That is to say, even the lowest among you, the smallest ones, that it looks like there isn't anything good there, 
No, Hashem says, there's a lot of good there. There's a lot of good there. So um, that's, I think, the similarity between the praise over here in chapter 6 and the praise back there in chapter 4. Now, there was one discrepancy between chapter 4 and chapter 6 that I wanted to highlight. And that is, in chapter 4, it says this, Mi ba'ad Behind your tied back hair, your hair is like the, 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 the flock of goats, meaning I can't see your hair. It's tied back. I can't see it. But I know that if you would let your hair down, I would be able to see all that beauty that's hiding back there. Even when it's hidden, I know that it's there. And in our verse here in uh, chapter 6, it doesn't talk at all about the hair being tied back. It just says straight out, your hair is like the goats, the, the flock of goats, right? The praise is there, but skipped, missing, absent is the fact that, that the hair is tied back, like it said in chapter 4. So I was wondering, if you're going to parallel the same praise, why skip out on the, the, the part about her hair being tied back? Anyone uh, have a suggestion here? I have a question. Uh, yes, go ahead. Okay. My translation in chapter four, um, says that, uh, your dove-like eyes look forth from behind your veil. Aha! Oh, you, I, I was waiting for someone to say that, but I wasn't meaning, I didn't think anyone would say that because I translated it like Rashi. But if you translate it like someone else, you avoid the problem. So you avoided the problem. And I would love to avoid the problem, but Rashi runs right into the problem. Yeah. So let me explain what, what Rabbi Yaakov is saying, and it's really very brilliant. The problem is that Rashi, who's also very brilliant, does not agree. So let's look at that verse again in chapter 4 that I put in the notes. i got to scroll down to it. Okay. Now I'm going to show you something else which makes it even more likely that Mr. Yaakov is correct. Right here, he praises her eyes also. Look at this. Behold, you're beautiful, my beloved. Behold, you're beautiful. Your eyes are like doves. But in our verse, he says, turn your eyes away. So he doesn't want to see her eyes. Back in chapter four, he wanted to see her eyes. Now he doesn't want to see her eyes. Right? So And so he says over there, your eyes, mi ba'ad letzamoseich, behind your veil. That's how... Yaakov wants to, instead of tzamaseich, which Rashi says is the thing which pulls the hair back, um, tzamaseich is translated by some to be a veil. And so here your eyes, which are behind the veil, are beautiful. That's what he's saying. And then the compliment about the hair is unrelated to the eyes. What makes this stronger is that here, here underneath the word tzamaseich, is this symbol that looks like a wishbone can you see the wishbone symbol you able to see it should i zoom on zoom in on it i'm gonna make it bigger so you can see it ready let's make it bigger let's make it so big okay um so over here is like a wishbone can you see the wishbone the wishbone is part of the cantillation notes part of the musical notation of the verse that tells us how to sing it and the meaning of that wishbone is that this is like a semicolon it's sort of like a a stop in the middle of the verse it divides the verse in half so that everything from the beginning of the verse till here is one item and everything after the wishbone starting uh starting over here till the end is the second thing so it makes perfect sense here we're talking about the eyes behind the veil. Pause. Here we're talking about the hair. Different from the eyes. Rashi does not do this. Rashi says, here's a praise of the eyes. Stop. And here, behind, not your veil, behind your tied back hair, your hair is, is shiny like the flock of goats. So Rashi wants to ignore this cantillation note and translate that as as the thing that ties back the hair and relate it to the hair at the end of the verse rather than the eyes which come before. 
Now, if Rashi hadn't done this, it would be very simple. Since he's talking about her eyes, so he says, behind your veil, very good. But in the second temple, he's saying, turn your eyes away. So he doesn't need to mention the, the veil because he's not talking about the eyes. He doesn't want to look at the eyes. So it makes sense why it's not there. But we have a problem with Rashi that he relates this to the hair. This, he says, behind the t- hair tie is your hair like a flock of goats. But in that's chapter 4. But in chapter 6, he doesn't mention that hair is tied back at all. So why not? So I appreciate your question, uh, Rabbi Yaakov. And I hope you, you can appreciate what I said, that you would you, what you're saying is very clever, except that Rashi doesn't accept it. So given that Rashi doesn't accept it, we need to understand the way Rashi is looking at the text. Why is the, the this item that he identifies as that which ties the hair back, why is it missing in the second temple? Any thoughts? So I'll tell you my thought. There, you could say a lot of things. Rashi leaves it, he leaves the field wide open. So your guess is as good as mine. But here's what I thought. When the hair is tied back, Rashi made a point of saying that these qualities, these, these positive qualities are hidden. They're hidden, like the hair which is tied back. They're hidden qualities. Um, he says, right, that's what he says, even the empty ones among you are beloved to me. The empty ones means on the outside, they look bad. You would look at these people, we, we, we talked about this. We looked at we would look at certain people and say these people aren't spiritual, these people aren't religious, these people aren't from, these people aren't uh, connected to God, these people are not desirable in the eyes of God, and that's our external judgment. However, we don't realize that inside the person could be many many positive qualities that are very beloved to Hashem, which is why it's important never to judge somebody because Hashem is only the true judge. So Rashi says even here. He says in chapter his his comments on chapter four, where it says behind your hair ties, he says me befnim lamacha osayich mishkan osayich within your your encampments and your dwelling places inside behind closed doors in the tents where nobody can see. I can see positive qualities that no one else can see. Right, so it kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense. Uh, just like Yaakov, that he kind of looked bad. Lavan was accusing him of look, looking bad, but I really saw through it. I really saw through it. So I wanted to say about this is as follows, and I even put this in the notes, and I think with this we'll, we'll, we'll close, okay? Um, um, where did I put it in the notes? That's my problem. I can't find where I put things in the notes. But I put something in the notes, which I think is very poignant. Is it before this? Bear with me. Let me see if I put it somewhere earlier. Yeah, here it is. Okay, this was my footnote number six up here. When it says, in, in, in chapter six, verse five, our verse that your hair is like the flock of goats, and I made a footnote number six. So here I wrote like this. Um, in Shir Hashem chapter four, it says behind your hair ties. And here it doesn't say that. Why is there a discrepancy? So I said like this, the difference between the first temple and the second temple is that in the first temple, the people had good character traits their character was not corrupt, even though their actions were not desirable to God. But in the second temple, their actions were desirable to God, but their midos, their character, had become corrupted. As we know that the second temple was destroyed because of what? Because of what? Everybody knows the second temple was destroyed because of the Ayn Ra, wasn't it? The the evil eye that uh not where I was going. No, okay, yeah, actually that 
that applied to something else, I suppose. But um, so the second temple was destroyed because of Basil's hatred, and uh, the Chavetz Chaim adds on to that in Lashon Hara because he relates the two together: evil speech to people would speak badly about one another behind each other's back, and even though that they would they would act nicely to one another, but in but but behind their backs they would speak badly, and they inside their hearts they hated each other. So. Um, just to bring out the point, I quoted the, the Gemara, the Talmud in Yuma 9b, which says as follows, listen to this. Mikdash Rishon Mipnei Macharav. Why was the first temple destroyed? Mipnei Shloisha Dvaram Shahayubai. Because of three things that existed in the first temple time. Avodizara, idolatry. Vigilo Arayos, Sexual immorality. It's two. Ushvichus damim, and the spilling of blood, meaning murder. Murder, idolatry, sexual immorality were all rampant in the first temple period. And for those three sins, it was destroyed. Aval Mikdasheni, this is continuing the Talmud's uh, uh, passage here. But the second temple, Shahayu Aiskin Betaira, they were busily engaged in Torah, uve mitzvos, and with the performance of commandments, ugmilas chasadim, and acts of kindness. Mipnei macharav, why was it destroyed, asks the Talmud. Mipnei shahai sabo senas chinam, because there was baseless hatred. Lelamedcha, this teaches you, sheshkula senas chinam keneged shalosh averos, that Baseless hatred is equal to the three cardinal sins. Idolatry, avodazara, gila, araya, sexual immorality, ushvichas damim, and murder. Baseless hatred, hatred of one Jew for the other, is equal to the three cardinal sins. Wow, wow, wow. Bombshell. Now, just listen where I'm going with this. A little bit of explanation. So the commentaries explain. Look at the difference. Look at the difference. I'm going to tell you something very deep right now. Look at the difference. When it was idolatry, sexual immorality, and murder, yes, the temple was destroyed. But how long did it take for them to get the temple back? Anyone? It was from about 576 BC to the early part of that same century. So about 70 years, something like 70 that. 70 years. It was a 70-year exile, not too shabby. Some people who stood in the first temple also stood in the second temple. Not too shabby, one generation. However, the second temple, which was destroyed not because of these cardinal sins, but because of hatred between Jews, hasn't returned in 2,000 years. Why is that? Why is that? So the commentaries explain. Because when the sin is on your hands, when the sin is on the outside of your body, it's external, it's superficial. It's easy, so to speak, to shake it off. We can change our actions relatively easily. Just stop doing it. But when the flaw and the corruption is inside the person's personality, it's ingrained, it's, to, it's, part of your, it's become part of your character that to change, to change that about you is changing something much deeper than your actions. It's changing your very essence. Changing a mida, changing a character trait is extremely difficult. You, you, you're, you're, you're changing your whole nature much, much harder. From that, we never recovered. From the corruption of character, which we allowed to seep in during the Second Temple period, we still haven't recovered in 2,000 years because it requires a change that's so deep that it's taken us millennia to accomplish it. And God willing, hopefully soon. But one's internal and one's external. So now when we look back at, there's more to say, but there's not so much time. We look back at these two verses. One verse says, behind your tied back hair, I see your positive qualities. That, that was earlier. That was the earlier generation. Because even though on the outside it didn't look good, even though on the outside 
I couldn't see the good qualities because maybe your actions were negative, but I saw inside that really you had positive character traits. And all you needed to do is just shake off those superficial acts and you'd be perfect. So God says, behind the tied back hair, I, where, where it's hidden away, I can see the good. It's hidden, but I can see it. But in the second temple period, our actions were on our clothing. But they, the action, the good acts, the good acts were external. But what was internal was negative. So God doesn't say behind your tied back hair, I see it. He says, I see it. I see it right on the surface. Yes, I acknowledge you have positive qualities. But those positive qualities, he doesn't say this. He says they're only so deep. On the inside, I see there's problems. And that's why maybe we could say in the same verse, God didn't want to bring back into the Holy of... So the Holy of Holies, very symbolically, was empty. The Holy of Holies, the chamber of the Holy of Holies in the Second Temple was an empty room. Looked good on the outside. Looked good on the outside, but on the inside, the Kedusha, the holiness, was lacking. It wasn't there. And God said, I can't return the the ark with the kruvim and the and the cover and the tablets, I can't return that into the inside until you bring me back into your inside. As long as your service of me remains external, remains outside, remains on the clothing, that's the way the temple's also going to be. So we, because we didn't fix that, because we didn't fix that in the second temple, we lost the second temple. Now here Shir Hashem right now is focusing on the positive, but just from the discrepancy between the earlier description and this description, we can read between the lines and see what was lacking in that generation. Isn't that interesting? I don't know if you find that interesting, but I, I, that was my thought. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. That was my thought on this discrepancy between the two. Okay. So, um, on that note, on that note, you're going to ask another question, though. But you, Rabbi Malad, said your hair is like the flock of goats coming down from the mountain. And that's where Lavan caught them. And Lavan said, Yaakov, you're bad. But Hashem said, even though you look bad, really, you're good. That was in the first temple. They looked bad but on the outside, but they were good on the inside. The second temple, they looked good on the inside. Were, they looked good on, good on the outside or bad on the inside. So... How do you say the same praise that you said when Yaakov came back from Lavan? So here I have a, an, another approach. And the other approach that I have is also in my notes, but I'm going to try to say it outside because the hour is up and I want to finish up quickly. If I find it in the notes, I find it. Meanwhile, I'm going to talk. That when Lavan returned from, excuse me, when Yaakov, Jacob, returned from Lavan's house, um, he sends a message to Asaph. And the message he sends to Asaph, and I'm sorry I didn't put the citation in the notes. The message he sends to Asaph is Im Lavan Garti Vo'echar Ad Ata. I had been living with Lavan and I tarried until now. I lived with Lavan and I tarried until now because he was gone for 20 years. He's coming back. He knew that Asaph was waiting for him with nefarious purposes he sends this messenger to tell him the whole story where he was what he was doing okay so um so here it is in the notes so our rabbis tell us an interesting an interesting um exposition of the verse im love on garti and rashi says this interpretation the word garti i lived garti is the same letters as taryag Garti, I'm love on Garti, right? I lived with love on Garti. It's the same letters as Taryag. Taryag is the abbreviation for the number 613, 613, which represents the 613 commandments. And what Yaakov, the message he was sending to Esav was, though I tarried at the wicked love on's house for a long time, Garti, I remained loyal to the 613 commandments of the Torah. In Lavan Garti also is, in with Lavan, 613. With Lavan, I continue to observe the 613 commandments, meaning I returned from Lavan's house righteous, even though I was in the house of a wicked person for many years. 
The same way when the Jews returned from Lavan's house, Yaakov and his sons returned from Lavan's house, right? So that's compared to the Jews returning from the exile, which we didn't have in the first temple, and we weren't returning from exile. Maybe you could say Egypt. But we went into exile. We lived among the non-Jews for 70 years, and we returned. And what does it say about us? We all were keeping mitzvahs and learning Torah, right? Okay, it was on the outside. But we were doing it, right? So here the praise of coming back from uh, like like Jacob and his sons came back from the house of Lavan, this praise in the second temple, that she's like the flock of goats coming down from Mount Gilad. We came back from the exile like Jacob and his sons came back from the house of Lavan, even though we had dwelled with those who were not loyal to the Torah, we nevertheless remained loyal to the Torah. And that can fit with the picture of the Jews in the second temple that the Talmud describes as those who were engaged in Torah and performance of mitzvahs and kind, doing kind deeds, acts of kindness. Though it was external, it nevertheless was an observance of the commandments which uh, we could be praised like Jacob and his sons who came back from Lavan's house. And, and, and Jacob said, though I lived with Lavan, I observed the 613 commandments up to and including my return. So that's the way that I would uh, interpret this comparison with the return of Jacob and his sons from the house of Lavan with the return of the Jews from the exile in the second temple period. Okay, and here we'll pause. Any questions? Thank you, Rabbi. Yeah, it was great. Okay, you're very welcome. So uh, thank you for coming tonight. And uh, God willing, next week's Tish B'Av. It's not Tish B'Av. Tish B'Av's on Shabbos. We're going to observe <coughs> Tish B'Av on Sunday. There won't be a class. So we'll meet again, God willing, in two weeks. Easy, Thomas. Yes. Have a easy and meaningful fast. And God willing, we should merit that uh, this year Tish B'Av will not be. Well, we are meriting this year that Tish B'Av is not a fast day because it's going to be Shabbos. But God willing, we should merit that. This year, rather than fast, we should ce be celebrating in the Beis HaMikdash in Yerushalayim B'Meri V'Yameinu. Amen. Amen. Okay, good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Take care. Razel says, final comment from Razel, the whole Song of Songs is amazing. I agree, Razel. The message behind them is mind-blowing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rabbi Rafi. Wonderful class as always. Thank you, Razel. I appreciate your uh, positive feedback, and I'm glad that you're joining us, and I'm glad that you're enjoying, and we hope to see you again. Everybody have a super great night.